Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 41. This is the Pretonic Gateway. This is going to be kind of a long video and it's going to get very mathy. Uh, but uh, I think uh, for those people that are not math uh, versed, might get the gist. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to begin the step-by-step -step process of the derivation of the pretonic field equations of ethereal mechanics. The, the original name for these was going to be new electromagnetism V5. Uh, since in the past we has renamed them because they're not going to look anything like new electromagnetism. So, um, But first we're going to do some refreshers on stuff and then we're going to look at why previous attempts to unify the forces failed and then we're going to get on to the pretonic gateway. This is my diagram, my way of looking at nature. This is called the epochs of natural structure. And what you have here is like a cornucopia where um, as each level is called an echelon and where chemical compounds, where they're virtually infinite chemical compounds are synthesized by 100 or less elements. 100 or less elements are synthesized by three tons, which is the electron, my symbols for the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And tons are synthesized by two pretons, which are inertialist charged particles. And uh, eons, that they're called for short epochs of natural structure, are related to the rule of acquisition number 31, where um, you have to get simpler as you go lower. Have to get simpler. Because simpler things have more uses. You can only synthesize infinity from something that is very simple. Thus, the theory of everything must be very, very simple. And let me give you an example of echelons. The compound echelon, which is right here, chemical compounds, and here I'm showing salt. Salt is a necessary element for uh, compound for life. Salt at this echelon is synthesized by the elements in the element echelon, and those elements are chlorine gas, which is toxic to life, and sodium metal, which is toxic to life because if you swallowed a bunch of sodium metal, you'd pretty much uh, uh, burst into a ball of flames because sodium reacts violently with water. Okay, but here are these toxic elements, okay, look nothing like salt, which they, is synthesized from them, and this is essential for life. And therefore, we have to realize that elements at the upper echelon may bear no resemblance to the lower echelon that synthesizes them. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people in the past failed, because they tried to take the observations at this echelon and try to directly derive the underlying theory. And we saw that with the magnetic field example in, new, uh, in the, uh, the, magnet, uh, the, the new magnetism video, which I believe is D002. Uh, essentially, that's, this, that's what I just said. This is where everybody goes wrong. They think they just can derive their way down to the lower echelon. And there's a, there's a lot of problem because the upper echelon models may also be wrong, which these are. These are Maxwell's equations. And I can show you the B-field abstraction is, is incomplete. The displacement current in Maxwell's equation is wrong. It causes over unity. And um, the change in a magnetic field does not directly cause an electric field. You need charge. Can't do it without charge. So these Maxwell's equations were wrong. So trying to derive the lower echelon from Maxwell's equations is going to be problematic just from the fact that they're wrong. And there may be other effects here that we aren't aware of as yet, which there is because new electromagnetism shows there's at least two other effects that aren't included even if these were right. And so then again, the upper echelon may bear no resemblance to the lower echelon. That's part of the problem. Although I have to give honorable mention to a man by the name of Jeffy Menko. I hope that's the right way to pronounce it. He correctly postulated, and I'll let you read this on your own. I'm not going to read this slide for you, so you can pause and read it if you like. Okay, then we have to review rule of acquisition number 10, and the name changed. I'm trying to revise the rules of acquisition I go to make the names more like the Ferengi rules, where the one line explained everything in the slide. And basically the way this goes is theories and models must mimic observations, not be derived from them. In other words, your theories and models would be the underlying the echelon, and the observations would be the upper echelon. So you can always treat the upper echelon as observations of a lower echelon, and therefore you have to derive in this direction, not this direction.
and that's pretty much what I just showed. You have to, these are the five terms of new electromagnetism, and, and there could be other effects that we aren't aware of as yet. And you can't just drive from here down to here and expect to get a correct answer. So what you have to do is find a way to go from here and get back to here. Okay. Again, you need to make a guess about the lower echelon and then try to derive the upper echelon and you may end up with more results that weren't previously known because as you go from the electric field through the magnetic field, each effect, one of these effects gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller where you know down here you need a million times amplification to see this very tiny effect down here you know like thousands of turns and very sensitive amplifiers to see this effect whereas down here there may be effects that are there that we just haven't noticed because they're so darn small okay and that's the other reason the reason why you can't go this way there might be still be maybe other effects you're not aware of and so how, how many so so we have to come up with a way to make a guess about the lower echelon and there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can do your judicious guessing and I've had little success with that and if you go back to uh, my papers uh, where I derived the new magnetism and, and new induction my training, my training told me that the underlying models had to be inverse square. Okay, so I've had little success. My training has kept me, held me back from from finding the truth by using logical or educated guessing because my education stood in the way. And Mark Twain said, don't let schooling interfere with your education. Then there's the other technique which has worked very well for me. It's called brute force. Use a computer to search all possibilities. And you have to include upon those possibilities things you might consider strange. And you have to do all possibilities, no matter how strange and stupid you may think they'll be. And I did that with new induction and in video number 18 where two solutions were found out of 45,000 possibilities and it turned out those two solutions were actually the same solution. And in the upcoming videos on the new math construct I found 128 solutions out of 268 million possibilities uh, and that ended up reducing to two. Or third technique is you can find a gateway. Now in video number 36 we introduced the tool gateway where a gateway tool provides a toehold which enables us to advance to the next level of technology. And the example is if you had in a city an axe then you can cut a branch and cut some string that now you can fashion a handle for the axe making the tool better until eventually you get up to machine tools and space shuttles and all that stuff. There's also theoretical gateways. A theoretical gateway is a clue, a paradox, an anomaly which we call pain in the other videos. Where there's pain there's gain. Uh, an example is uh, video number 33, the transverse wave was the gateway to realize the ether must be a binary medium. Okay, this is the only way you can have a transverse wave passing through a medium is if the medium is binary. So now we got still have some gateways on deck. These are gateways introduced in previous videos we haven't used yet. And one of the gateways is force needs to be replaced because pretons are inertia, so force is meaningless. And I don't know about these video numbers. These are uh, uh, to be announced. Uh, energy needs to be replaced. Energy requires mass, but we're talking about inertialist particles. So the definition of energy for, at the pretonic level is meaningless. Constants of relation have to go. Rule of acquisition 24. Uh, and we have dis there, all the equations of new electromagnetism are still disconnected equations. We need to break them up into cause and effect. This will happen in this video. And in video number 16, the antenna paradox provides a gateway into the nature of fields at the pretonic level. Oh, that's actually in this video. So again, the process is we've got to make a guess at the lower echelon and derive all the upper echelon effects. And remember, these are just observations. Okay, this is Coulomb's model, not Coulomb's law. It's not a law. It's not a law of nature. All this is is an empirical data. They took empirical data. They found that that data fit an inverse square relationship, and they needed a constant of relation to correlate those measurements into the force that was observed. So all this is is a, ma a curve fit of experimental data. So all this is is experimental data. All of these are derived from experimental observations, including new induction. And you look at video number 18. You see how that was. Um, so there still may be other effects that we're not aware of. So these are observations. You can't take your observations and derive the more fundamental explanation. 
So you have to make a guess and derive toward the observation. Same again with the magnetic field and D002 and, new, and magnetic. We just can't take the magnetic flux lines you see with the dumb iron filings and say that's a magnetic field. Because your observations may look nothing like your fund underlying models. So shall we begin? Again, don't assume that these are correct or complete. And some of these may actually be pretonic models. We don't know yet. And again, these models may look nothing like the pretonic models. So how do we proceed? Well, we've got to use rule of acquisition number 20, which I used to call use Colombo's method, but again, I'm trying to rework them into titles that explain what's inside so they're more compact. And this got changed the name to pay attention to details. Don't ignore those little details that don't add up. They should keep you awake at night. So the clue is right in front of you. Okay, this is new electromagnetism. Again, these are just observations of experimental data. And we have other, uh, the, the, the uh, gateways on deck, like we need to get rid of force. We need to break these up into cause and effect, which are essentially emission and coupling. So these all need to be split. Um, and there's up other ones. I forgot what the other gateways are right now. But within these models is a gateway, a clue. Now, if you want to try to figure it out for yourself, you put your camera on pause right now, because I'm about to explain what the gateway is. If you notice this model here, the direction of the force is proportional to the direction of the acceleration of the source charge. So the behavior of the source charge gives us the direction of the force applied on the target charge. The and this term here, number two, same thing. The velocity, the direction of the force applied to the target is proportional, is in the same direction, is related to the direction of the velocity of the source charge. That happens with this term too, but this term is different. The direction of the force is radial between the two charges. Has nothing to do other than by magnitude to the velocity of the source. This looks more like an electrostatic equation. So number four is strange for the reasons I just explained. So let's just take terms two, three, and five. And if you look, put them together in one equation, okay, if you're versed in derivatives, you should be able to see the product rule of derivatives here. Okay, well maybe not. Well then let's take these two terms, put them together. And then what if I told you that R, which is the vector radial distance between the target and the source, which is the position of the target minus position of the source, is R. And if I take the time derivative of this, dr dt, which is the derivative of PT minus PS, that works out to the velocity of the target minus the velocity of the source. And then if I multiply that derivative, or dot it rather, with the direction vector of R, then what I have is the, the velocity components in the direction of R, which is the derivative of the magnitude of R with respect to time. And so now if I plug this, replace this which is this little part here, see this? That's this. Replace that in that equation with this. This is what we get. And you should see the product rule of derivatives, which means if you have two functions of time, u, v, and you take the derivative of those two functions multiplied together, you get the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. That is the product rule of derivatives. And that's what this is here. And I'm gonna, we're going to break that back down and do the inverse derivative, which is the integration. So now we've combined those three terms into one very simple term. Now there might be a constant in here, because basically we just did antiderivative, anti, we just took the antiderivative, which is the integration. So there may be a constant of integration in this bracket, but let's not worry about that now. We'll fill that in later if we, if we decide we need something. Okay, but we now, this is still a disconnected model. There's still, you know, you've got a source charge over here and a target charge over here, and this still couples together, both the emission and the coupling are in one, clumped together in one equation. They need to be disconnected. 
And luckily we have another clue. If we observe term number two, and you can see this in the magnetism in the the uh, new electromagnetism video, which I believe is D004, that you could have a current over here, and until you move the wire closer, then you will see that this charge will pick up a negative energy or a velocity in the negative direction. Therefore, the space around this charge must be energized, and until you move the charge into it, that's when you couple energy out of the field created by this wire. And therefore, now we know how to split the emission and the coupling because the emission has to always be there and the coupling ha occurs only when the derivative occurs. So the derivative is the point where we split the uh, coupling and the emission. So the field is generated, the, the disturbance in the ether is, dis is generated by pretons in motion where Q is a quantity of pretons. The I field, this should be bold, is a vector ampere field. It has the units of current, which obviously is amperes. You can't get some more simple than that. And it's a simple inverse field, meaning the, the, the amplitude drops off by the distance. But that's where you know a lot of people went wrong when they tried to do it before, like I did in the really early beginning. I always thought it had to be an inverse square field. It doesn't. It's just an inverse field. Now the problem I have now, so now we can split the emission, the field, the vector ampere field is just charge times vector velocity divided by the radial distance. So if you have a current, or I'm sorry, if you have a charge in motion, then at any distance from that charge, you can calculate the direction of the vector ampere field. It's a vector ampere field. And then the way you can determine the coupling is you take the time derivative of I, which this is part has an element of the target in it because it's for the distance from the source to the target. And that's how you couple the energy out to find out what the force will be on the target charge. Now the sign, there's an issue with the sign. Do we put the sign here or do we put the sign here? I don't know. I put it over here because I figure this has to be, excuse me, the negative of the direction of the current. It has to be negative. Because if you had a current in motion this way, your field should be the opposite direction. Kind of gives it gives the balance to the emission. So that's where I'm putting it now. Until we find out something different, that's where it's going to stay. And now this all makes sense because in video number 16, in the antenna paradox, in order to resolve the paradox, we inferred that light, radio waves, must be an emission of kinetic energy phenomenon which is consistent with amperes. This is the little diagram we came up with to explain what, uh, to resolve the paradox in the energy coupled into a target antenna. And that our gateway produces vector ampere fields is very exciting. So we have a partial result now. We have a guess. We made a guess. And that guess, when we derive the other way, we only get three of the five terms. What about the other two? Well, could there be a second component that we could derive? Well, the rules of acquisition, especially the epochs of Mother Nature or natural structures, say no, because if you've got two electronic fields, the electric and magnetic field, then as we go down the cornucopia of the epoch, you should only have one pretonic field, and that, my friend, is your unified field. And therefore, we have to resort to rule of acquisition number 31, which is the complexity versatility duality, which I've got to find a better name for this. But essentially what it means is, in order to explain more stuff, your models have to be simpler. And logically, the theory of everything should be ridiculously simple. So, in order to explain these other terms here, this needs to be simpler. This is a blurry image of the true model. Okay, And basically the way we can analogize this uh, this pretonic gateway that we're showing you, this model here, which is this, is basically like, you can analogize it as a blurry image of a distant galaxy. It may be blurry and incomplete, however, it's detailed enough that we got our foot in the door and we can fix the missing parts by using other gateways. And that's essentially what I'm showing here. So with these models, we're going to apply a correction that we're going to derive using other gateways. We've already split it by emission and coupling, 
and that should making it simpler it's got to be simpler than this that should explain the five turns plus if there's anything else it would explain that too okay but again this is just a toe hold into the echelon of the pretonic field there are other gateways or clues that we need to follow up to infer the needed corrections okay the next video uh, 42 we're gonna have a ghost and ether addendum and then we're gonna apply some other gateways number 46 is a look ahead um, uh, the reason why I need to look ahead is kind of give you, you know, we got a long way before we get to any cool stuff like faster than light drive or all that kind of stuff. But I want to show you in this video all the steps we're going to do uh, until we get to the to the really cool stuff. So we got a long way to go before we get there. We've got a lot of gateways to cross. Anyway, thank you. And thanks for the donations I've been getting. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you want to donate, you can go to my website. There's a button there. My website's highly outdated. Uh, I'd rather do the videos and fix my website, to be honest with you. Um, I will get to one day get to updating my website. And thank you for all your comments. Uh, have a nice day. Goodbye.